I mentioned to Paul, but for others, if you have questions during the talk, put them in the chat and I'll I'll relay them the comments at opportune times. Uh, otherwise, there'll there'll be some time after uh, Patrick's discussion to uh, gather further comments as well. And otherwise, without further ado, Paul is going to tell us about digital ecosystems. Okay, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So. You know, this is a paper that's joint work with Mats Köster and Botan Kozigi, and it's a theory of digital ecosystem. Oops. Okay, and so sort of the motivation is sort of two stylized facts that have been, you know, widely discussed. And so first is firms like, you know, Google or Alphabet, you know, Meta, they offer a wide variety of service and literally a wide variety of services. These are hundreds of services, right? And they often grow by acquiring smaller firms that offer new services, okay? And so what I'm gonna try and do is sort of combine this fact with the second fact, and that is that digital ecosystems often steer consumers towards their own services, right? So you, they, they, they may set predetermined defaults, they use recommendations, rankings, visual cues, or something like that. So there's a large debate about self-preferencing to direct the consumer's attention towards their own further services. And so what I'm gonna do is a, develop a theory of digital ecosystems that just connects these two observations. Okay, and so let me sort of point out that this cross-market steering is really frequent, right? So if you do Google search, then um, you know it either does or has done until it was told not to preferentially treated Google Flights, which used to be ITA, and they bought and turned into Google Flights. You know, once they bought YouTube, there's articles that show that, you know, they're more likely to uh, send you to YouTube videos rather than, you know, the same video on a Facebook page or something like that. And many of you will have followed the Google sh shopping saga, um, you know, about self-preferencing. Similar sort of if you if you have a windows computer right then by default you have microsoft edge as an internet browser and that sends you to let's say bing which used to be power set until they bought it which is their search engine or it sends you to um you know outlook as an email by default which is uh, i think the former hotmail or you know to link into something like that right or if you you know have your 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 iphone and you listen to music in a bar if you ever go to bar Right, and you're like me and you don't know what the hell it is, you can use Shazam to find out what music it is. And then if you want to buy it or something, you know, they sent you to Apple Music, which by the way, used to be iTunes, which used to be a uh, sound jam or something until they bought it. And you know, Google's competing service, of course, doesn't send you to Apple Music, it sends you to YouTube. And you know, Facebook preferentially treats WhatsApp and Facebook Messengers and so on. And so, you know. The premise of this paper is that steering is consequential. Now, if you're a behavioral economist, you've taught lots of stuff on nudging and defaults and choice architecture effects. And there's a huge literature on this saying that this does play a role. And you know, this is also a policy concern. So there have been antitrust cases and you know, regulation. The DMA has some stuff, I might get back to it at the end, that limits cross-market steerings of digital gatekeepers to their own products. But I think sort of most dramatically, you know, if you follow the, the recent Google search case in the US, there sort of, you know, I, I, as a behavioral economist, I thought steering is a big deal. But that it was that big a deal was a bit of a shock even to me, let's put it that way. And so sort of some of the evidence that, that was out there is something like in 2021, sort of Bing's US market share on Edge is almost 80%, while on any other browser, it's it's below five and typically way, way below 5%, right? And what's the difference? Well, you know, on Microsoft Edge, Bing is simply the default and most people stick with the default. And indeed, Google pays roughly, you know, 40% of all of its ad revenues on Apple devices to be the default search engine on Apple, right? And this is a huge sum of money. And mind you, it pays this despite the fact that what we normally teach is, you know, it has this huge advantage due to, um, you know, data effects, net, you know, network effects and so on. So we normally say, you know, it's much, much better. So consumers should flock to Google anyhow. And yet Google pays this huge amount of money. Now you could, you know, having a bunch of IO economists, I'm sure you're smart enough to come up with all kinds of theories why they do it, right? Despite uh, um, this data network effects. But if you look at the evidence from the um, Federal Trade Commission, and you know it's up on the web, you can just 
sort of scroll through this internal documents and testimony that that they selected, you, you you find these sentences like you know Google has to do what it always did, pay to play, and so on, and they really emphasize how important this default position is, and you know also the managers from competing competing firms, you know that who knows what their incentives are, but at least under oath they all kind of said you know defaults are really important. And perhaps one sort of useful example to think about is Apple Maps, right? When Apple Maps, if you're old enough like me, you remember when Apple Maps came, it was sort of the joke in every newspaper about how bad it is. But it turns out that by now it's the dominant iPhone Maps application in the US. Um, and now what dominant means, I don't know the market share because that was redacted, but presumably that's above 50%. So again, sort of the default position really made a huge difference in the development, uh, or arguably did. And so what I'm going to try uh, and, and talk about is a steering-based theory of digital ecosystems, right? And so the idea is that by cross-market steering, I can sort of send the consumers whose attention I have to my own product. And that gives them an advantage and that gives me sort of an incentive to grow into many markets because I can then benefit from this um, steering, perhaps a little bit less. Obviously, we're going to argue that that also enables me to buy firms at a discount. So I can get a takeover discount, which reinforces my incentives to grow. And sort of in, in our model, we predict that sort of these takeovers are most profitable for what we call market leaders and access point markets, which, you know, loosely think of markets where consumers start their online journey and then they move on. So, you know, search might be an example. And these um, market leaders as access point markets grow into ecosystems, you know, search or social media, something where you start sort of your day and then you get sort of sent off to their complementary services. And we predict that they do so by taking over market leaders in adjacent markets in these complementary services. So they don't buy any firms, they tend to buy good firms. Okay. Now in the theory, these access point markets have a special role. And so default positions at, at crucial access points are somehow sold, we'll assume. So like Apple selling the default position. And in our model, they simply auction this off through second price auction. Although I don't think this is very important. And ecosystems tend to win these auctions. So we're gonna argue that firms that are active in many markets, it's more important for them to win these auctions and get sort of the consumer. That's something we're gonna call the default multiplier. And then I'm gonna at the end, hopefully get to sort of some implications for regulating digital ecosystems and roughly because we predict that these ecosystems consolidate and steer users to good services from a static perspective, that's good for users. You know, in line with the idea that users love Google and they hate the idea of choice screens and something like that. You know, they want Google to be out there and you, you can find this sort of lots of commentary on the internet to, uh, you know, attempts to regulate this. So statically, they're very good. But they come at the cost of often reduced um, incentives for entry, including entry for buyout, which is, you know, Tommaso Valetti and others have sort of argued that, you know, we should not let these big firms buy new firms. Uh, and the counter argument typically is, well, that's really bad because, you know, we have these startups that develop some complementary service and, you know, they do so to sell to these big firms. And so here it sort of says, well, even in this case, there can be reduced um, incentives for entry, and I'll explain why, and innovation incentives. So in a sense, this comes at a sort of dynamic cost, this dominance of ecosystems in, in, in this sort of simple theory. Okay, so if there, there's no questions right now, I would jump into the model. Very good. So let me get to the model. So the basic setup, there's going to be two markets. Right, And I think of the market A as an access point market, like search or maps or something where the consumer initiates his sort of time on, on the internet. Okay, so that's where they start. And then, you know, they might search for something like a flight something, and then, you know, they find Google Flights, which is sort of the complementary service that they get directed to. So that for me would be market B. Okay, so nothing here is, you know, hinges on the fact that there's just two markets, you can easily extend this to many markets. But let me think of two markets for the time being. Now in each service, right, in each of these two markets, um, the service is offered by at least two firms. Okay, so there's potential competitors out there. And some of the firms may be active in more than one market. 
And indeed, since I only have two firms, if you're active in both markets, I'm going to call you an ecosystem and otherwise your single market firm. Now we assume that all prices are constant and then we can just normalize them to zero. So the idea is that you offer some digital service that you monetize with advertising. And so a firm's total profits will equal the total demand across all of its services. Okay, and so in this sort of benchmark, all firms are equally good at monetizing uh, the consumer's attention. And then sort of, Firms, I'm going to assume that firms can be weakly ranked in terms of the quality they offer. So all else, a better firm has a higher market share. And I think now is a question. Is it important that uh, all firms have one access, oh, sorry, all consumers have one access point, or is it important that they all have the same access point? Let's, let's assume they all have the same. So it's not, I mean, there can be many access points. Um, and then you can start thinking about much more complicated networks. But as long as sort of most consumers go from search to something, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's, you know, my rough answer. And we can get back to this in the discussion. But let me sort of first try and highlight the basic model. But for the moment, I want you to think along. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let uh, ask me again in the discussion and I'll give a, a more precise answer. Okay, so let me first go through the basic mechanism and then if I keep it in the back of my head, I'll try and try and answer it as I go along. But you know, as long as most consumers move from A to B, things are fine. So now I'm going to model default effects. Okay, and I think of them really as a modeling device. So in each market S, one of the one firm's product is chosen as the default. And so the default means that I sort of preference this, um, this product. So this could be literally that it's the default search engine, or it could be that it's pre-installed on your mobile and easier to find, or it could be in rankings that I tend to rank this product higher or something like that. Anything that sort of moves demand to a particular product, I'm going to call default. Now, I know behavioral economists sometimes like to use these terms more narrowly, but I want you to think of this sort of more broadly. And so I'm going to have the notation that from I's demand when from J when is the default in market S is QIJ in it, market S, right? So of course your demand depends on potentially on who is the default from. And, you know, the assumption I'm going to assume throughout the absolute, the premise of this paper is default is good. Okay, so you have a higher market share if you have the this default position than anyone else. And so all our results sort of, you know, use this assumption and this is the basic premise. Default is a desirable thing. Sometimes I'm also going to make a stronger assumption and that's a, what I call assumption one here, which is the quality steering complementarity. And so roughly speaking, what this says is a better firm, you know, benefits more from having the default position. And so let me sort of deep, pack this assumption one since it has sort of three numbers here. So assumption one one says, if rival J is better than rival J prime, then your market share is greater when you face J prime. So if a weaker firm has the default, you know, that's better news for you. If, 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 it, if it happens to be a rival, you want a weak rival to have the default, not a very strong rival. So that's assumption one one. Assumption one two says, if firm I is better than firm I prime, then the better firm benefits more from replacing a, a different firm J um, than the worse firm, right? So the default position is more valuable to a better firm. That's assumption one, two. And one, three is sort of closely connected to the first two. It basically says, if I is a better firm than J, then I is willing to, pay more to replace J, then J would be willing to replace I. So again, sort of the idea here, this quality steering complementarity says better firms benefit more from having the default position. And so the paper then goes through various micro foundations for default effects that are sort of prevalent in the behavioral econ literature and argues that for some always and for others under sort of weak conditions, sort of assumption one is satisfied. Okay, so it's an assumption, but it doesn't seem that strong an assumption. 
and I'll make clear when I use it. And so just very quickly, I don't have time to go over them, but these are the you know micro foundations for default effects. Um, so one is consideration sets. So you're not considering all products in, e in each market, but you know less than all products, a given fixed number of products. And the only default um, benefit is that you're always considered. So the default firm is always considered together with you know a given fixed number of rivals. And that sort of gives you in our setting very naturally this quality steering complementarity. There's a little bit more in the background. You know, you, you draw a value for each product independently and so on, but you get the rough idea. So this is sort of like a simultaneous search model, but the default effect is that you're always in the in this set. The second one is kind of the idea that. It's basically this, the same model as one, but sort of with a different rhetorics. So the idea is I, I learn something about your mood and then I can you know, direct you to the, the right mood congruent product of myself and I'll be always considered. Three is my favorite. This is probably, uh, you know, I sometimes think of it as a model of myself or maybe of a grandfather. So this person just uses the default if it's decent enough and otherwise they give up. Right? They, they don't even know how to change a default. So that's probably me, right? I use this app if it's decent enough, if it's too bad, I give up. And then we have sequential search, switching costs under some regularity conditions, recommendation loss aversion. And all of these sort of give under reasonably weak condition, you know, this um, steering quality complementarity. So you can forget about this as long as you're willing to buy assumption one, you don't have to think about these micro foundations at all, at least don't. So let me now tell you how the cross-market steering works. So for the moment, for the sort of the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'll assume in market A that the default is exogenously assigned to some given firm. Okay, and I'll, I'll relax that in, in, in 10 minutes or so. And in market B, the default depends on the consumer's behavior in market A. So suppose that the consumer uses service A of firm I, if the firm I also offers service B, if it's an ecosystem, then that automatically becomes the default. So it's going to self-preference itself and set it itself on the default position. If it's a single market firm, then you know all products are on equal footing and the default in market B is chosen simply at random in the model. Okay. And so here sort of built in is this idea that ecosystems can steer via defaults across markets. Okay. Any questions to the setup so far other than David's? Uh, I have a quick question. Yep. Uh, I don't understand why the better company would benefit more to be the default. Uh... Okay. okay, so just think of this as an assumption, but again, sort of now I could go back and say, look, this is simply what you get if you if you solve a model with consideration sets. So it's very natural and sort of the, the idea is, so maybe three is sort of the easiest to case to walk through. I'll give you one case and that is, suppose I'll just use the product if it's good enough and I give up otherwise, if it's too bad. Then if I have a better product, less consumers give up. And so I have a higher market share, higher market, you know, higher number of consumers using it. And so I can monetize better. Or in a consideration set, you know, I'm going to be compared to other products. The better my product is, the more likely I'm going to win the product comparison. And so, the, you know, it's really important for me to be considered. And so that in this sort of attention foundation, that's why I would be willing to pay more for the micro foundation. Uh, sorry, more for the default position, because it's more valuable uh, to be considered. Uh, paying for a micro foundation, that's uh, uh, okay. <laughs> So, so that's the rough idea. So you are more likely to monetize, you know, given the default, you're more likely to get the consumer if you have a good product and that makes it more valuable for you. Does that? Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's just that in the case that you are proposing, uh, the default for Google or other searchers are basically inside of another product, right? So there's two things going oh, on in this in this scenario. So, so so that this is the second part, which is what I say here, right? So here, the, the scenario that I just did is I focused on one service. So being the default on search is more valuable for Google than for Bing as the assumption. So they would be willing to pay more to Apple than Bing would. 
right? So that's kind of, and and you know we would make the same assumption in other markets. So that firm that if you know the fault is random has the largest market share. That's the one that's willing to pay most. But again, it's sort of I only need this for some results, and I can tell you, and I will tell you exactly where I need it. So many of our basic results work even without that assumption. I think we have another question. I think Mukshin. Yes, um, Paul, I'm wondering whether you assume that uh, these two companies, they have the same quality, like the, the product, the same quality. No, no it's, it's reduced form, it's in the background, but in, in, in general, kind of why are you better product, you know, if the default is random, if you have a better, distrib you know, you, you generate higher values for the consumer, say it's randomly drawn independently across products, then you're going to be better if your first order stochastically dominate them. So, you know, these companies will be different in their quality and so on. That's all in the background. And I modeled this just through this market share. I see. Thank you. I have a quick one. Are we, are we going to come back to this assumption on cross market steering being automatic? Because, I mean, in some sense, you can argue some people value it more than others. Um, in the discussion. So okay. I have something, yeah. but yeah. at the moment it's automatic. In the model, it's automatic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but okay. So so now let me get you to the preliminaries, and then from the results, you kind of also see why it might be natural to impose it. So first, just language-wise, I'm going to call the default advantage the increase in a firm's market share when it is the default rather than it ra being randomly determined. So that's the benefit you get from obtaining the default uh, position. And then I'm going to call the default externality the change in firm I's market share when J is the default. So that's sort of rather than it being randomly determined. So that's kind of the impact that it has on me when someone else becomes the default. That's the default externality. And now you can think about, you know, what's the gain in firm I's market share when it replaces a rival J as the default? Well, that's just the default advantage minus the default uh, externality, right? So that's the benefit that I get if I replace you as a default, something that's going to play a role later on, okay? And then there's sort of a lemma that is absolute immediate from assumption one, and that says if firm I is better than firm I prime, it has a higher default advantage. That, that's basically assumption. Sorry, that's 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 uh yeah. So and uh, one two is for any firm I, there exists another firm J not equal to I that imposes a negative externality on you. So in principle, it could be, for example, good news if the default goes to a very bad firm rather than being randomly determined. But in general, you don't want sort of a very strong firm to have the default position. And more precisely, under I should be very careful what I say here, under assumption zero. That is, as long as the default is good news, um, you know, you get uh, you you get sort of this the second part that you know some rival must hurt you if they get the, the default position. Okay, everyone's with me. So these are sort of the two effects I'm going to make use of as I now talk through the emergence of ecosystems in our model. So. First, I'm just going to have this observation that this cross-market leverage or this ability to steer to my own product increases the incentives to grow. Okay, so suppose initially all firms are single market firms and allow some firm G, and you can think about what G might stand for, that is active in market A to take over one of the single market firms in market B. Okay. Now in the first sort of takeover model, and we go through, you know, different takeover models, but in the first very simple one, this firm G makes sequential take it or leave it offers until a firm accepts or, you know, all firms reject. And you, we look for subgame perfect equilibria of this takeover model. Now, if you take over given target T, the market share of target T increases. And in particular, it has sort of some standalone value. Some market share would have had absent the default. Plus, you know, the probability that firm G as the consumers, you know, it's demand in market A is sort of the number of consumers for which it automatically can self steer or for which it can set the default. And on that market, you know, share, 
you get the default advantage. Okay. And so, you know, when you take over this firm T, it's going to get bigger because it's going to be defaulted and you're going to default your consumers into this. And, you know, the default advantage says how beneficial this is. So note that here, what this predicts is if you buy such a target, then the market share of the target increases, but there is no sort of technological synergy or something going on. It's just due to this steering to your own products, right? So, and the larger the firm G is, you know, the, the more important is default advantage. So the bigger the firm, the more benefit it, it gets from taking over or from, from owning the target T. Okay. Now we can now look at, okay, so how much do you have to pay to take over the target? And so, so suppose G wants to take over some target firm T in market B, how much does it have to pay? So first observe that we had just a lemma that there always exists some competitor that imposes a negative externality on target T. So there's some firm T star that if you take it over, it has a negative impact on firm T, right? So that firm T does not like that other firm to have the default position. And let's sort of, from now on, let me just impose assumption one because then it's sort of easy to talk through it. Under assumption one, it's actually always the strongest rival. In general, that doesn't have to be true, but under assumption one, it's always the str strongest rival. Now, suppose that the firm G takes over this competitor if firm T rejects, and you know the proof verifies that that's actually what it's going to do. Um, then in this case, firm T would earn less than its standalone value, right? So if it rejects the takeover offer, then it knows that another firm will be bought and that reduces its value. And now I see a typo, that's annoying. Delta G should be QGA, but the market share of firm G and market A, right? So if I have a large market share, then I'm gonna default, if you don't sell to me, I'm gonna default many people into this rival of you that I buy. And that's going to um, reduce your market share. So you're willing to sell below your standalone value because you fear that I buy someone else otherwise. And so that means that firm G can buy these firms sort of below value, right? This also means that firm G gets a discount on the takeover price. Um, yeah. So maybe, yeah. So maybe at this point, let me point out that um, just, just a, a quick clarification from the comments. The the form of bargaining here is, I go to one firm. If they say no, then I can approach another firm. Yes. So it's a sequence of take it or leave it offers. Yeah. yeah. Now observe here, kind of that you know the discount is going to be bigger, the bigger I am. Okay, and so that's something I'm going to make result of now. So take over of the market leader in equilibrium. So first, you know, so far I, I, I told you I get a firm at a discount, whom am I gonna buy? Well, my profits from the takeover is, you know, the first part we had that when I own this target T, I'm gonna have an increased market share in market B and then the discount that I get for taking over. Summing this two together, you know, I get my market share in market A times, you know, the advantage of replacing from T as a, um, as a T, as a, the advantage of firm T replacing firm T star as a default firm. So that's the, the net profit I'm going to make out of this takeover. And under assumption one, this is highest when taking over the best firm while threatening to take over the second best firm. Okay. So in general, this is always going to be, you know, some firm for which is optimal, but under assumption one, it's a very simple structure. I always want to buy the best firm and threaten to buy the second best firm. So under this quality steering complementarity, what I get is that this firm G is going to tend to buy the best firm in market B. And that's sort of the, the result, right? So if, if it has positive market share in market A, then G takes over the best firm at, at the price we just went through. And so this model sort of endogenously here predicts the convenience benefit, right? So consumers get the best service by default. So they, they like this, this feature of the ecosystem. So this ecosystem that develops is going to um, have this. And it's also going to be that, you know, it's tech firms that benefit more from takeovers than let's say financial investors. So Icefield has this nice paper that we cite 
where um, she discusses this fact that, you know, in the economy wide, it's more and more hedge funds that do sort of takeovers of little firms, but not in the tech sector. So there we ob typically observe tech firms doing these takeovers and they seem to be getting good deals. So that's certainly in line with sort of this prediction here. Now we, we sort of go a little bit further and somewhat endogenize the acquirer and the emergence of ecosystems. So now sort of we have this simple game where now every firm in market A and B can apply to be the acquirer. So anyone can sort of raise their hands and said, look, I would like to be acquirer. And then whatever firm we select, the selected acquirer plays the same takeover game as before. So it goes to the other market site and makes sequential take it or leave it offers. Okay. And then we, we assume that the firm that generates the highest takeover profit is selected. Right. So you could think of a law firm as organizing this acquisition and taking a cut and then wants to sort of get the most profitable takeover. But more seriously, kind of the way I think of it is, look, in reality, these takeovers are costly. You have to prepare the bid. You have to do a bunch of stuff. And so the more profitable it is, the more likely you're going to do it. And so we'll take the extreme view that it's the most profitable firm that gets to move. So if firm I in market B, so let's think of, suppose a firm in market B, which is not the access point market, takes over a firm T in market A, some target in market A, well, it's still going to earn um, profits. And again, um, delta T should be QT. So whatever the market share of this target was in market A, QTA, times the default advantage of its own default advantage in market B, right? If it takes over some firm in market A, it can steer some consumers to itself, right? So firm I, however, cannot threaten to otherwise steer consumers to another firm in market A. So it cannot sort of default consumers into something in market A, so it doesn't get a discount in the takeover. Firm T, in contrast, gets a discount when taking over firm I. So it would get, again, delta should be QTA times uh, what I wrote here. So, you know, if I reverse the roles, the former target market A, if that would start this takeover game, it could threaten firm I with taking over another firm I prime and sort of withholding some demand by defaulting its rival. And so it will get a larger uh, discount uh, or it will actually get a discount. And so it benefits more from a takeover. So that's sort of the proposition market leaders in an access market take over the best product um, in market B. And, uh, and you know, the, the larger your market share in market A, the bigger these effects. So it's the firm with the largest market share in market A in the access market that grows. So it's market leaders in the access market that are the ones that grow into ecosystems. So something like Google, right? Or, you know, you're the social media firm, then you grow into the, or, you know, in China, Tencent or something like that, right? It's the big firms that at the access points that are the ones that grow into ecosystems. And sort of, you can easily have an extension where you have many markets be, Either, you know, because you direct firms from the access point to different markets B, because consumers want to go to different markets B, or consumers go from market A to market B to market C, or something like that. And then it's still going to be these ecosystems, that are the big firm that starts taking over, and it's always going to select the best firms. So it, you know, these ecosystems are an umbrella of, of, you know, by this logic, a number of good firms. Okay. Let me take it. A short break before I turn into the access point market. If there's another question, no. Um, David, did you want to ask? I mean, we have about five minutes, so maybe. Okay, so then maybe yeah, let me rush I, through the I, access. Yeah, I have a quick question. Like, it, it sort of seems like the bargaining could be multilateral. So, the second best target could offer Google a G a big bad deal and that constrains the bargaining with one. It sort of seems like you get that, but I wasn't clear how so, you so we have an extension that I didn't not talking about where we let's say the targets are all the same. That's our extension, but we have many firms in market A that mm -hmm. bid for the targets. Um and so now there could be a scarcity of targets. There could be only two targets or something like that, while there's many firms in market A. But we assume that the targets are equally good. So even then, we show that you can still buy them under value. And the reason is kind of now we're going to have multiple mergers happening. 
And so under the standalone value where these mergers would be all disallowed and everyone steers the consumers to your to, to their own customers. Um, and so if, in, you know, the, the strongest firms do the takeovers, they have lots of steering powers, they steer them. And, you know, the firm that doesn't get to do a takeover as usual is the firm with sort of slightly less market share. It's, that's, it's willing to bid less. Okay, yes, this was no, quick. Right. So we have an extension in the paper where we do this with market shares and we can get the similar type of results. Of course, if there's only one target firm and multiple firms bidding for it, then you could get, uh, then you could, you, you know, then the takeover game could be beneficial. Yeah, let's that's partially responsive, but let's, let, it's almost like it, it could be, if you have like two, two access point, two A firms and a oh, bunch okay. of Bs, you so, could have yep. a different setup. And with one A and a bunch of Bs, it's slightly different. Anyway, I'll I'll, I'll send you. I'll yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll return to that in the discussion. So I th I think we have a few things to say, but let me get very quickly through the um, access point market. So the default in market A is now sold via a second price auction. So this is something like Apple's having a selling mechanism, and let's do a second price auction because it's the easiest one. And for simplicity, let's assume that there's two firms that are active in market A, G, and another rival M, and you can think about who M might be. But in the model, M might be single market or multi-market firm or ecosystem. And I'm going to impose assumption one for the discussion. And so in the second price auction, as usual, we solve for the equilibrium and weekly and dominated strategies. Now, first observe in a benchmark with single market firms, because the best firm has the highest value from the default position, it's the best firm is going to get the default position. So this auctioning off is in the interest of the consumer, even if they get no direct or indirect payment from it. Okay, so this is kind of as a benchmark. But now if you introduce an ecosystem, think about the ecosystem's willingness to pay. The ecosystem's willingness to pay is sort of its increase in market share in market A. This is this Delta AGM in market A. Plus, once it's got this attention, it's going to recycle it by set using its default setting power in market B. So it's going to have a higher willingness to pay for the default, default position than single market firms. And it gets this default multiplier, as we call it. Okay, so the obtaining the default position not only boosts demand in the access market, but also in other markets. And so, you know, this is going to be even more important if there's many other markets and so on. And so this can help to start explain why Google might be willing to pay such exorbitant amounts for the default position and such. And if you compete with ecosystems, then you can sort of get this multiplier to go up even further. Why? Because now if the consumer doesn't end up at Google search, they end up at Bing, then Microsoft is going to steer them towards other services. Then, you know, and it's going to be harder to get the consumer in market B. So losing to a rival ecosystem would be even worse. And this sort of helps uh, pay the vision. And so let me wrap up because I'm going to run out of time. So what we then sort of in policy have, we have sort of, a short run convenience benefit versus a long run harm in the following sense. So the ecosystems consolidate and steer to good services. And so as long as you, you make the assumption that you know um, consumers benefit from a good default, which is natural, it's, I think it's sort of search maps and, and many, many markets, but of course might not be the right assumption for social media, which is addictive. And I think there's good reasons to worry about social media, but sort of let's assume for, for the discussion right now that consumers like a good default firm. Then, you know, this is beneficial to consumers because they tend to be steered to good services by default. But they often impose long run harms in a sense of a lack of contestability. So there's gonna be reduced incentives to enter both markets. Right, so it's easiest to see in market B. If you enter in market B, lots of consumers are gonna be defaulted to a rival and so it makes entry less profitable. Even if the ecosystem isn't active in market B yet, you know they're gonna sooner or later have an incentive to make a takeover. And even if you sell to it, you have to sell at a discount. So this sort of reduces the incentives to enter in the market and similar investment incentives. Now in market A, you have kind of this, similar story because there's this ecosystem, even if you, let's say AI, you come up with a better search engine because you don't recycle the consumer's attention across all these other markets, 
you know, Google here would have a higher incentive to pay. So it's going to be very hard for you to win the auction. But then this might be partially responsive. Suppose a new access point opens up. Now, if you, you know, if you're able to get a new access point, that's good news. Because now, you know, you're going to be very valuable. And so per firms will be willing to pay a lot for you. And so this predicts that ecosystems are really going to fight very hard to get new access points, like Android for cars or something like that, right? Because that might be a new access point to steer consumers, and they're very valuable. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, roughly speaking. And then I just noted that, indeed, we have sort of policies that limit self-preferencing, so the ability to steer or leverage the consumers from one service to another. Um, and we have a bunch of policies that um, sort of make it easy to change defaults and so presumably lower default effects. And these sort of would in this model help sort of in the long run. And, you know, we discuss this in a little bit more detail in paper and there is related literature, but not much. So let me skip it because I'm out of time. But, uh, but Patrick, you're on here. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. That was that was awesome, and thanks for for keeping to time as well. So um, Patrick is going to give the discussion. Uh, Patrick, you're going to get have to get off mute. I'll stop sharing. Is better now. <laughs> so I was saying thank you several times actually, and uh, um, it's a and thank you in particular for inviting me to participate in this uh, very interesting session. Um, it was a real pleasure to read the paper, to listen to a, a crystal clear presentation. As you have seen, the, the setting is uh, highly parsimonious, which is uh, really great. You, know, you have a few minimalist assumptions. The analysis is elegant, as uh, always the case with Paul, and uh, delivers many interesting insights. Uh, my, my task here is, is not to, to summarize the paper, but to, to provide a few comments to, to open the discussion. And I will uh, address uh, two sets of issues. Um, the first one is, is uh, uh, relates to uh, takeovers or mergers. Um, now, what, one of the insights of the paper is that firms from the access market benefit from a takeover discount when targeting a firm from the other market. And this is because the targeted firm realizes that rejecting the bid may induce the uh, access firm to, you know, switch to a, to a, to a rival, and that would be bad news for the targeted firm. Now, th this is reminiscent uh, to some extent to the, uh, the, the response to Maggie's critique of predation. Uh, Maggie argued that a merger was an equally effective but cheaper way to eliminate a rival. Uh, and therefore, you know, according to this logic, uh, predation was not a, a rational thing to do. Um, Yami and Salona replied that predation could still be a way to uh, a useful way to reduce the acquisition price. However, in Salona's formalization of the argument, the acquirer had to engage in, in dealing predation. Here, instead, the mere threat, threat of moving to an alternative target suffices to, to reduce the takeover price. Um, relatedly, the, in, in our literature, we often simply assume that uh, it takes to tango, a merger takes place whenever it increases the joint profit of the merging parties. Here, the analysis goes further and suggests that because of these uh, takeover discounts, the access firms, the firms in the access markets, are more likely to be the, the acquirer. It may, I, I, it may use, be useful, however, to, to, uh, to use a more explicit takeover game. And I think that there were some discussion, I mean, David's questions were also related to this in order to try to, to, to capture this, uh, this intuition a bit more formally. Here there was, the, you, you, uh, in the presentation, you, you relied on a, on a third party like a law firm and so on, but depending on the, so when you introduce a, an agent, a third party, in the, depending on the agency uh, objective, the agent's objective and so on. Here in particular, if the law firm had a cut on the price, at the acquisition price, it would, it would, it would favor the, uh, the other side of the market. Um, now, the second related uh, comment, uh, takeovers versus alternative arrangements. So here, the emphasis is placed on takeovers with other than alternative contractual arrangements, which is perfectly understandable given the, the focus on the, uh, on the ecosystems and the emergence of ecosystems. But still, you know, this may warrant a bit more discussion. For example, the firms from market B 
would in principle bid to be recommended by the firm's market aid, as in the case of position options. And actually, the, you know, similar to the logic that you apply to, uh, you know, uh, to determine who will be the, uh, the, the default in the, in the access market. Now, one notable difference between the, the merger uh, or the takeover scenario and the recommendation system scenario is that you know, a merger with multiple firms in the access market may not be feasible or, or allowed by the by regulator. By contrast, the same firm in the B market could in principle be recommended by multiple and could be to be recommended by multiple uh, firms, uh, access firms. You know? So discussing the, the profitability of uh, those alternative arrangements may, may, may be useful. Um, a small uh, comment on the side. Again, the emphasis here is on mergers, and more specifically on conglomerate mergers, which is again understandable given the focus on ecosystem. But it may be interesting to, to study possibly firms merger incentives in the in the targeted market in the in the market B, given the strategic incentive that they may have to be selected as the target or joining the ecosystem or or, or to reduce uh, the uh, the discount the Tesco the takeover discount. And finally, uh, still on the on this uh, issue of mergers, um, a brief comment on successive mergers. Here, the analysis predicts that the, 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 in the more you have an ex this extension that you, you you didn't have the time to cover, where you consider the possibility of you know several mergers, several successive mergers. Um, but what you what the analysis predicts here is that all firms become ecosystem at least. As long as the national ecosystem can be formed, it does arise in equilibrium, and it's not necessarily what we what we observe in practice, and it's not it's also not uh, what we find in, in the paper with Zichun that you mentioned in your in, that was on your uh, on your slide, um, and therefore it may be interesting to to discuss what could be the potential counter forces that uh, may limit the desirability of uh, subsequent mergers. Um, the uh, the analysis also suggests that there may be assortative matching. Uh, in the sense that the best access firm are merging with the best firms in the other market. However, the extension in question, as you as you mentioned already, you, you focus the rest of attention to symmetric targets. You know, so all firms are symmetric in the in market B in that extension. And it may be interesting to, to relax that uh, symmetric assumption to see you know, what would be the general conditions that um, uh, ensure that you still have an assortative matching when you have uh, heterogeneous firms in, uh, on, both, uh, on both markets. Um, in uh, 30 seconds on, uh, on the, the second issue, which is the welfare analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, it's always a bit tricky to develop a welfare analysis when you have a behavioral, quote unquote, uh, uh, consumer. But mm -hmm. I really welcome the, the, the pretty rich discussion, actually, that you, you propose in the paper and by mm -hmm. relying essentially on the assumption that uh, even though there may be some behavioral biases, it's still the case that more popular firms are likely to, do, to be the ones with the better offerings. Um, and that, uh, that uh, gives you, uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of mileage, and uh, that, that's, um, that I found interesting. Now, in uh, the first finding of the analysis, that in the short term, you, uh, consumers benefit from uh, the, the, the emergence of an ecosystem. You, you, know, you mentioned this uh, convenience benefits. It's more likely that your consumers end up with the, the, the dealing with the best, uh, the best firm. However, here, this relies on the implicit assumption that firms do not adapt their strategies to, you know, to the size of their consumer base. You know, in, in practice, if they manage through steering and so on to increase the number of their locked-in consumers, let's say, then they may be tempted to increase their prices, lower the quality, in which case the creation of the ecosystem may be a more of a mixed blessing for the consumers, even in the short term. So you, know, you, may, you may want to, 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 to discuss this. Indeed, in the paper was Zidjo, that, that's the that's the main source of harm. You know, so the main source of harm is due to prices the price increase despite the, the creation of the consumption synergies or confidence benefits. And in the long term, the, the, the you have a good a good and interesting discussion of the long term impacts and entry barriers and and and, and so forth. But while it is true that the creation of an ecosystem is a bad news for for the rivals. Uh, you, you, you actually insist in the paper the fact that you know, because of the takeover discount, uh, it may not be great for the target, but it's also not so not so good for the for the rivals. You know? uh, so all firms, if at least under assumption one, all firms would uh, would uh, would be harmed in the in the targeted market. 
Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, they have less incentive to innovate. You know, the, it's uh, what matters, even if all profits go down, you know, the, the, the profit differential and, and, and the implication for the incentive to, uh, to, uh, to, to invest or to, uh, or if for no other reason, to be selected as a target or to uh, reduce the takeover you know, discount, um, it may be interesting to try to, to elaborate a bit on, on this. Well, maybe in a follow paper, I don't know, but uh, you have an interesting building block here that you, you could put to uh, good use in that direction. Let me stop there.